Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a Bahama Mama. I'm drinking another Seagram's. This time it's a Calypso Culotta. I bought a whole bunch of them uh, around New Year so I could have some left over for the podcast. On today's episode, we'll delve into the Highway of Tears, a 450 mile long portion of Yellowhead Highway 16 in British Columbia, Canada that runs from Prince Rupert to Prince George, British Columbia. The stretch of road was given this name due to the overwhelming number of indigenous women that have gone missing around or been found murdered along the highway since 1969 and the pain it's caused their families. 23 First Nations communities border Highway 16, and First Nations people are indigenous people that are not Métis or Inuit. They were the first inhabitants of what is now called Canada and the first to be in contact with European settlers. This area surrounding Highway 16 is plagued by poverty and lacked adequate public transportation until very recently, making it commonplace for people to hitchhike. Highway 16 is also in a rugged and rural region of the country with many logging towns and not much else really going on. The highway serves as the connection to the outside world for this area of Canada. The exact number of victims of the Highway of Tears is unclear, but the Royal Canadian Mounted Police officially acknowledge 18 murdered and missing women and girls. Of those 18 victims, 10 are Indigenous women. These 18 victims are who we'll be focusing on in this episode, but we'd like to note that Indigenous communities think there could be as many as 43 victims. Victims range in age from 12 to 33. The first official victim was 27-year-old Gloria Moody, a mother of two who was murdered in 1969. She went missing in Williams Lake, British Columbia, after spending the evening at a bar with her brother while on a family road trip. The siblings left the bar, and when her brother looked back, Gloria was nowhere to be found. Her nude body was found the next day on a cattle trail. She had been beaten, sexually assaulted, and ultimately bled to death from her injuries. Her killer has never been found. After Gloria's murder, at least eight more women and girls were found killed or had gone missing from this area of Canada in the 1970s. In 1981, the RCMP took notice of the growing number of missing and murdered women and organized a conference with 40 officers to investigate. During the conference, some similarities about the cases were discovered including accounts of the same suspicious vehicle in the area and persons of interest. An initiative was then created to further investigate these cases, and that lasted from 1981 to 2005. Despite this almost 25-year-long initiative, women, particularly Native women, were still being murdered and going missing. In 2002, Nicole Hoare, a white tree farmer from Alberta, went missing while hitchhiking on the way to meet her sister, and has yet to be found. Nicole's disappearance caused a media stir and garnered lots of attention. In 2005, RCMP created Project EPANA to investigate some of the unsolved murders linked to Highway 16. The purpose of the investigation was to determine if a serial killer or killers is responsible for murdering young women traveling along major highways in British Columbia. Hana is an Inuit word describing the spirit goddess that looks after the souls just before they go to heaven or were reincarnated. The program began with 70 officers and a multi-million dollar budget. E. Pana has three criteria for a victim to be on their list. First, the victim must have engaged in high-risk activity, including hitchhiking or sex work. Second, They must have had been last seen or their body must have been discovered within a mile or so of Highway 16. Finally, the victims had to be female. Their list began with three cases and eventually grew to 18 in 2007. The investigation also expanded to include victims from Highways 5, 16, and 97. In addition to Gloria Moody and Nicole Hoare, E. Panna acknowledges these 16 other women and girls as victims of the Highway of Tears. Michelin Mare, 18, found murdered in 1970 after hitchhiking. Gail Ways, 
19, found murdered in 1973 after hitchhiking. Pamela Darlington, 19, found murdered in 1973 after hitchhiking. Monica Ignaz, 15, found strangled after walking home from school. Colleen McMillan, 16, found murdered in 1974 after hitchhiking. Monica Jack, 12, disappeared in 1978. Her remains were found in 1996. Maureen Mosey, 33, found beaten to death, thought to have been hitchhiking. Shelley Ann Bosco, 16, missing since 1983. Alberta Williams, 24, murdered in 1989 after spending the night at a bar with friends. She had been sexually assaulted and beaten to death. Delphine Nicole, 16, missing since 1990 after hitchhiking. Ramona Wilson, 16, murdered in 1994 after hitchhiking. Roxanne Theria, 15, murdered in 1994. Alicia Germain, 15, murdered in 1994. Lana Derrick, 19, missing since 1995. Tamara Chitman, 22, missing after hitchhiking in 2005. Isla Auger, 14, murdered in 2006. Again, there are many other victims of the Highway of Tears, but they do not fit EPANA's criteria. In 2012, EPANA solved their first case, the murder of Colleen McMillan. DNA evidence connected American felon Bobby Jack Fowler to her death. Fowler had led a transient lifestyle and worked in Canada at the time of her murder. Fowler died in an Oregon prison in 2006, but he's believed to also be connected to the murders of Gail Ways and Pamela Darlington. In 2014, Gary Taylor Handlin was charged with the murder of Monica Jack after being part of a Mr. Big investigation, which we talked about in the Rafay family murders episode. During the investigation, he told undercover officers the exact location Monica was abducted from. He is currently serving life in prison for her murder and another unrelated murder of a young girl. Another notable solved Highway of Tears case that EPANA didn't investigate was the 2010 murder of 15-year-old Lauren Leslie. Lauren was murdered by Cody Lechbikoff after meeting him online. Lechbikoff is one of Canada's youngest convicted serial killers and killed three women in addition to Lauren. Several other Highways of Tears cases not investigated by EPANA have been solved, but a majority do remain unsolved. The RCMP reports that since the creation of EPANA, it has collected 750 DNA samples, conducted 2,500 interviews, investigated 1,413 persons of interest, and administered 100 polygraphs. No new cases have been added to their investigation since 2007, but we want to stress that that does not mean that women and girls have stopped being murdered or going missing from this area. EPANA has unfortunately received numerous budget cuts, which has caused them to drop cases and reduce staff. As of 2016, they were working with just eight investigators, which I think that might have gone up. I couldn't find an exact number. But Staff Sergeant Wayne Clary has admitted to victims' families and the media that some cases may never be solved. He believes that people within these communities coming forward with information is the most realistic way for these cold cases to be solved. The RCMP as a whole has been criticized for the way the Highway of Tears cases have been handled and they have been accused of racism and not taking the cases seriously since many victims were involved in sex work. According to some families of the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, the police had assumed that many of the women were drunk, prostitutes, or had consented to sex before their disappearance or murder. Ramona Wilson's mom even said the police blamed her for creating an unhappy home life for her daughter. And Ramona was considered missing for 10 months after she disappeared before her body was eventually discovered in 1994. So with that, I'm assuming they thought she ran away, which I feel like we say that in just about every case. The police think someone ran away when they didn't. In October 2015, an email scandal involving government officials in British Columbia arose. 
The province's Information and Privacy Commissioner released a 65-page report stating officials triple-deleted all emails relating to the Highway of Tears and therefore breached the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. And triple-deleting means permanently deleting these emails. Someone really had to go out of their way to do this. Many of the permanently deleted emails were related to meetings the Transportation Ministry held with First Nations communities in order to create safer travel options. A former executive assistant to the Transportation Minister tipped off the commissioner about the deletions and said he blew the whistle because his father had been murdered and he felt sympathy for the Highway of Tears families. Since then, multiple officials have resigned or been fined for their actions. Families, not police or media, have been responsible for spreading the word about the highway's dangers and victims. They've initiated awareness campaigns and held a symposium in 2006 that made 33 recommendations to the government in the areas of victim prevention, emergency planning and teen response, victim family counseling and support, and community development and support. Because of their distrust with the RCMP, many families rely on private investigators to look into the cases of their missing and murdered loved ones. One of these investigators is Ray Mahaka, an ex-RCMP officer who offered free services to the victim's families and made it his mission to solve the Highway of Tears cases. Mahaka regularly traveled 800 kilometers from his home in Vancouver to interview people and search for clues. In Canada, private investigators have much of the same power as the RCMP, but RCMP officers were territorial and felt Mahako was stepping on their toes. Some families say they are in touch with Mahako more than the police. In some cases, Mahako has passed information and leads on to the RCMP and hasn't heard back. That's the scenario with Ramona Wilson's case. Mahako has his own theories as well. He believes Alicia Germain and Roxanne Theria's murders could have been related since their bodies were not far apart from each other. They were both involved with drugs and sex work, and both girls claimed they wanted to get out of sex work. In 2017, after facing public pressure, British Columbia Transit started three new bus routes along Highway 16. In 2018, the province's Minister of Transportation reported that about 5,000 people had used the new bus routes in its first year of service. In 2016, the Canadian government launched the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls after meeting with victims' families across Canada to determine expectations. It committed $53.86 million Canadian dollars over two years to the initiative with the goal of producing recommendations on concrete actions to address the disproportionality of high rates of violence towards Indigenous women and girls in Canada. They set out with a focus on prevention in addition to tackling issues of systematic and societal discrimination, but was criticized for lacking the transparency and inclusiveness it was intended to have. In 2019, the final report was completed and presented to the public. The report spanned more than 1,000 pages and contained 231 individual calls for justice and legal imperatives, including supporting Indigenous-led prevention initiatives in the areas of health and community awareness and amending the criminal code to consider violence against Indigenous women and girls as an aggravating factor at sentencing. The report declared that the violence against Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, and asexual people is a, quote, national tragedy of epic proportion, end quote. Further, they stated, quote, to put an end to this tragedy, the rightful power and place of women, girls, and two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, and asexual people must be reinstated, which requires dismantling the structures of colonialism within Canadian society, end quote. So today, that seems to be where the Canadian government is at with helping Indigenous women and girls to not experience these crazy rates of violence. Um, Like Dell did say, the last report went out in 2019, and we all know 2020 was kind of a crazy year, so I'm not sure if maybe things didn't really get done because of that or what. I haven't really been able to see 
where they're at right now in their research. Uh, but we did want to thank multiple groups and activists who have really pushed the government for this much needed call to action. We'd like to thank activists, Amnesty International, the Native Women's Association of Canada, Walking with Our Sisters, journalists taking their time to cover these cases and injustices, and private investigators like Ray Mahonko. Del, do you think more of these Highway of Tears cases will be solved? Honestly, without more people like Ray Mahonko, no. I don't think that these cases would be solved if the power solely rests within the hands of the RCMP. I don't know what to think. I feel like some of them will be solved, but then at the same time, like you're saying, I don't really know what the RCMP are doing. I don't know if this inquiry is going to light a fire under their asses, but it seems like they've really just screwed everything up for these poor people. And unfortunately, I do kind of agree with Sergeant Clary's comments about how some of these won't be solved. And I don't want to say it's up to the communities because that's putting too much pressure on them. But I understand what he means when he says people coming forward, acquaintances, people that know someone that knew Ramona Wilson or Alberta Williams, they will help solve these cases. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, definitely in this case, but in a lot of cases, it's really the people that have the most interactions with you that can give better clues as to who would want to do you harm. I will say too, Ramona Wilson's mom made a good point. Her name is Matilda Wilson. She was interviewed by a Canadian news outlet and she said, it's a 20 year old case and nothing has come up. I can understand where the investigators are coming from because her body had been laying out there for 10 months and there was rain and snow and sleep. So stuff like that is not working in investigators favor to help solve these cases. And Sergeant Clary had mentioned this too, that some of these cases are stranger violence, which is difficult to solve. We know that so many of these women were last seen hitchhiking. A stranger is likely picking you up if you're hitchhiking and a stranger can drive you to God knows where and dump you off. And that's another um, aspect related to the case we mentioned in the beginning that Highway 16 is very rugged and rural and there's lots of little roads off the main road where someone can dump you and then they could never find you. We mentioned that Lauren Leslie, who was murdered by Cody Lejbukov, she was found because the police actually saw Lejbukov like driving on this like remote logging road in the winter and they were like, okay, something's up because no one should be out here at this time of year this late at night. And when they pulled him over, they saw that he had blood on him and he had her belongings with her. And that's how they ended up arresting him, which I think is like a pretty cool story to hear. It just goes to show how easily people can be hidden in this area. And thankfully, we did see some good police work in that case, people that were familiar with the goings on of the terrain and whatnot. But do you think there could be multiple serial killers at work here? Absolutely. I think there's multiple serial killers. It's one of those things where they're all working in tandem with each other in a way where they might not be aware of who the others are, but they're using this common spot that they know that they can get away with just dumping a body. Definitely. I agree. I think there are definitely multiple serial killers at work. I mean, we know that Cody Lejbukov, he was a serial killer and that Bobby Jack Fowler was likely a serial killer too. So that's two right there. And we know that Bobby Jack Fowler was in jail for a certain point. And Cody Lejbukov was only born in 1990. So he couldn't be committing all of these crimes either. I'm sure that there are a lot more similarities that the police haven't really made public. But I definitely think there could be, especially with all the hitchhiking, if someone knows that's a hot spot to pick up unsuspecting victims, I'm sure they would return. Right. It can be a part of a killer's M.O. It wouldn't be the first one. It's making me think of the Green River Killer, who had a similar M.O. of picking up people that he knew would get into his car. I don't know if anyone listens to True Crime Garage, but they're one of my favorite podcasts. And they've mentioned a few times how for certain serial killers, their car really is like the most important thing for them. They mentioned um, the Green River Killer, Ted Bundy, and a few other ones. And I'm sure with at least one of these killers, that's the case too on the Highway of Tears. Now, Del, do you think saying that you're looking 
for a serial killer could hurt these cases because I kind of think it does. I agree because I think what happens is it breeds an environment for a copycat. And I think that in addition to that, we just have a cultural fascination with serial killers where we want that to be the case because that's the hot thing. Like, ooh, this is a serial killer case. When in actuality, it could be 27 people all thinking this is a highway that does not have much transportation support, doesn't have many people trailing through it. We know that the weather is going to help us out. Let's all use it. I definitely agree. And I think another aspect too is that it makes people think that they're looking for just one person when there's so many other people out there. I, I'm i sure most people are true crime fanatics out there listening know that most people are murdered or hurt by people they know, not some random stranger serial killer. Not to say that your friend couldn't be a serial killer, but I don't know what the statistics really are for that. But I think it really erases, you know, the the violence from people that we know. Um, Alberta Williams was last seen with her friends. I have heard interviews with her sister and she thinks she knows who did it. And I kind of doubt it was some serial killer she saw on the news. I don't know if there's any names that have been made public in her case. Again, something that Ray Mahalko had said in an interview with him, he thought Alicia and Roxanne's cases were similar and he thought that maybe a pimp killed them. You could say... Maybe the pimp was a serial killer, but he's not going out and like stalking victims the same way I guess you would typically think of a serial killer. Right. Yeah. In that case, it's more so of a, you know, shady business dealings going awry and then him using murder to try to clean up the mess. Do you feel hopeful at all with this new inquiry or do you think it's more like a little too late? I think that it's important to have as many eyes on it as possible. So I don't want to say that it's too little too late, but I will say that I hope that they're putting in the time, the money and the dedication into it and it not just being something that they're putting out to say that they're putting it out there. Yes, I 1 million percent agree with that. And I guess I am a little hopeful because all of the calls to action and the like imperatives that it includes It really is like a widespread thing. It's not just one area that they're focusing on. They're taking in everything from supporting survivors, uh, supporting community health, and getting um, the criminal code changed to impact sentencing. So that seems promising to me. It's not just one or two little things. That really does seem more like a systemic change. Even their criteria is a little suspect for me because... It does exclude a lot of people that should be within it. Like, I'm not sure why they only allow victims to be women. That was actually one of the criticisms of the National Inquiry, that it didn't include men that had faced violence too. So I definitely understand where that's coming from. And this is all connected to the violence that Indigenous women face in Canada. Indigenous women are five times more likely than any other ethnicity in the country to be raped or murdered. Despite making up only 4 to 5% of the population, Indigenous women make up 16% of female homicide victims. And from 1980 to 2002, there was an estimated 1,200 to 4,000 missing or murdered Indigenous women and girls. Amnesty International released two reports within five years calling for action on this crisis. They mention inadequate police response, disproportional high numbers of Indigenous women in Canadian prisons, and the role of racism and misogyny in perpetuating violence against Indigenous women. It really wasn't until a white tree planter, Nicole Hoare, went missing from the highway in 2002 that the RCMP finally launched EPANA and this investigation, and until the media took notice. is kind of a reflection of what Amnesty International was talking about and the systemic racism that Indigenous people face, particularly women in a unique way. Many victims' families 
did not have high incomes. Many were living in poverty and therefore they didn't have access to resources. So if you don't have funds to create a reward or funds to even print flyers, you know, you're automatically like a few steps back. And it was because of um, these funds that Nicole Hoare's name really did get out there. Even Nicole Hoare's family was surprised at the amount of attention her case was getting compared to the indigenous women. And, you know, it kind of made them question things too. Rates of unemployment are high in certain indigenous communities. They're higher uh, than rates of white people in Canada. So again, we're talking about this income inequality and disproportionate access to resources. There's also a general distrust of police in certain indigenous communities. When I was researching, I actually found a story of youth that would purposefully hang out around surveillance cameras in case the police came after them because that way their behavior would be recorded, which is just so disgusting and it really mirrors so much that's going on in America too. And because of this distrust of police, there's misinformation and miscommunication. And we see that in that estimated number. So the estimated number of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls according to the RCMP, is 1,200. But if you ask indigenous communities, it's 4,000. And that's because of people not reporting crimes to the police. And like we said, a lot of this goes back to the systemic racism. So for example, Stephen Harper, the former prime minister of Canada in 2014, stated that violence against indigenous women and girls in Canada should not be viewed as, quote, sociological phenomenon. He said they should just be looked at as crimes. And this was after a teenage indigenous girl was found murdered. Her body was discovered in a trash bag in a lake. And it was a case that really shook the nation from what I've heard and really kind of made people start wondering like, what is going on with this crazy amount of violence? And not long after that, he stated that a national inquiry on missing and murdered indigenous women wasn't, quote, really high on the government's radar, end quote. And he's also claimed that there was no history of colonialism in Canada as well. So this type of attitude that Stephen Harper had is really a byproduct of systemic racism. Another byproduct of that is not addressing poverty, health concerns, violence, issues with foster care, and incarceration rates in Indigenous communities across Canada. All of this led to very visible inequalities in investigations. That's what led to so many activists and Amnesty International putting their life's work into saying something is going on with Indigenous women and girls. Our sisters, our daughters are all being violated and going missing and their rights are getting taken away. We also have to talk about the stereotypes that are often perpetuated by non-Indigenous people and offensive words that go along with that. So one of the major stereotypes of Indigenous, Native, and Aboriginal people is that they're drunk and violent. Settlers and colonizers used to think of them as savages, really, that needed to be guided because they could not be trusted on their own. So we have terms like half-breed, squaw, which is a promiscuous native woman, all very harmful. Native women and girls face lots of violence, not just murder and abduction, but domestic violence as well. Um, There's high rates of domestic violence in Indigenous communities. About one in three Indigenous women have suffered abuse at the hands of her partner. And that's not to say that Native men are abusive. That can be any partner that they have. People say that this also goes back to colonization and stealing and Native men not having, I guess, like the same job opportunities and stuff that they used to have, which then leads to anger and then that gets taken out on Indigenous women. And of course, that's not everyone's experience. Um, But we've seen this in the Highway of Tears victims. Several of these women were murdered by their husbands. One was even murdered by her cousin, too. We also have to look at the modern issues that stem from the settlers in Canada and in the United States. So the United States has 574 federally recognized Indian tribes. According to a Harvard study, one in 10 Native Americans have felt discriminated against. This includes over one third having a personal experience with racist slurs and violence. 
Native Americans are more likely to be killed by the police than people of any other race. Native women are two and a half times more likely to be raped or sexually assaulted. And 97% have experienced violence perpetrated by at least one non-Native person. Native youth not only have the lowest graduation rates, but they are also dying by suicide at the highest rates of any demographic in the United States. These same teens are twice as likely to be disciplined than their white peers in school and are twice as likely to be incarcerated for minor crimes than teens of any other race. In 2016, Native American protesters were attacked for protesting against the Dakota Access Baskin Pipeline. And they were protesting because they disagree with where the pipeline was at because it was going to go through sacred burial ground. Local authorities called it a riot and blamed the protesters, and this included tear gassing them and committing other acts of violence. And in Canada, we're seeing pretty similar things. There are 617 First Nations communities in Canada, representing more than 50 nations or cultural groups. There are two other Indigenous communities as well, and they are the Métis people and the Inuits. Native women were often sexualized and racialized violence was an accepted thing with colonizers. Um, Native women faced forced sterilization during the eugenics movement, which there was the Indian Act, which was created in 1876 and not abolished until 1999. And that did many terrible things like making it illegal for First Nations people to practice religious ceremonies and it took away some women's rights as well. The main goal was really to just eradicate First Nations culture and force European culture onto them. There were also residential schools, which I think might have happened in the United States as well, but they were government-sponsored religious schools that were established to assimilate Indigenous children into Euro-Canadian culture. So again, stripping them of their Aboriginal cultures, and many children at these schools faced terrible physical abuse, neglect, and sexual abuse as well. I've heard really terrible things that happened to these poor children. And then in the 1960s, something known as the 60s scoop took place. So this occurred because many indigenous communities, particularly those living on reserves, were rampant with poverty, high death rates, and socioeconomic barriers. And with no additional financial resources, provincial agencies in 1951 inherited a litany of issues surrounding children and child welfare in Indigenous communities. And instead of trying to repair the communities and bring resources to them, they removed children from their homes and gave them to white families, basically. And this happened from the 1960s to the 1980s. It's still kind of going on today. I've heard of the Millennium Scoop as well. Really scary. Um, Provincial governments consider the removal of Indigenous children the fastest and easiest way of addressing Indigenous child welfare issues, again, instead of just going in and trying to really help these communities from the core. And a lot of these issues that we were talking about that are still going on in modern times, like economic issues, all goes back to colonialism and the dispossession of land. Another thing that I personally wanted to address when it comes to the Highway of Tears is hitchhiking. I don't know what it is, though, but I'm so fascinated by how common it was for people to hitchhike. People do still rely on hitchhiking. There are billboards up along the highway that says, like, don't hitchhike, it's dangerous. It's clearly still happening if they need to keep these billboards up. But I don't understand how people thought it was ever safe to do this. I think I come at this from just a slightly different angle because I'm someone who doesn't drive. So to me, anytime I hear about hitchhiking, I'm like, oh yeah, like Uber. You just don't know who it is before you get into the car. Like, so I definitely understand why if you're trying to, you know, get to where you're going, there's no buses around. I definitely understand why, despite the risks associated with it, people decide to hitchhike. I think I would definitely be someone to hitchhike. It sounds like like a fun, you know, gamble to do, even though I'm not a big gambler. That worries me, Del. But you're so right, because 
it is very similar to Uber. We just, we don't know these drivers and we trust them. I mean, with Uber and Lyft, they do need background checks as far as I know. So you can at least have some of, you know, some peace of mind with that. And you bring up a good point because some people do hitchhike out of necessity. We mentioned many of the victims of the Highway of Tears were in low-income communities, might not have had access to cars or really reliable transportation. So hitchhiking is the only option. Hitchhiking was pretty common in the United States during World War II and the Great Depression. And it was seen for a while as just another way to help Help people out like one of the videos I saw it said that people would like get dressed up to go and like stick their thumb out on the road and then what really did damage to hitchhiking was that cars became more affordable people had access to them and the major highway systems um that were put in place in the U.S. Some people do think that horror movies played a role in the decline, but I don't know if there's like evidence on that. But I will say like that serial killer boom of the 70s and 80s, I know that would have influenced me. I think that there were some high profile um, cases of violence too that might have scared people off. But despite that, there haven't been many statistics to show that hitchhiking is dangerous. With all that being said, there clearly is an epidemic of violence that Indigenous women and girls are facing in the U.S., but especially in Canada. The statistics cannot reflect the experiences of the families and communities who have lost a loved one. The missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls were mothers, daughters, sisters, aunties, cousins, and grandmothers. Let us know in the comments what you think about the Highway of Tears and whether or not it's being handled appropriately. Make sure you click the subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube. We release new episodes every Wednesday. Follow us on Instagram at Crime Corruption Cocktails and on Twitter at Charade Inc. Please consider donating to our Patreon. This will help us get better equipment and bring higher quality content to you. We appreciate any amount you can get. This is Jenny and Dale signing off. Stay safe. Thank you.